Подача Остин! Все-таки Hello and welcome to another episode of the Southampton Delivery Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the Southampton Football Club and all of the SFC fans. My name is Matt Markson and I'm the host of the show and I'd just like to thank you for taking the time to listen and download and encourage you to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, whether that's iTunes, Stitcher, Acast, Google Play, TuneIn Radio, uh, or anywhere else. And I also remind you that we're now on SoundCloud and YouTube if that works better for you. So if you subscribe, you will get every episode automatically. You will not have to manually find it on Twitter or Facebook uh, and, and download it yourself. Um, you can follow us on Twitter or Facebook, though, and you can do that at SFCDELL underscore IVERY on Twitter or at Facebook.com forward slash SFC delivery. Uh, and before we get to my conversation with Ewan Campbell, who was my guest this week, uh, I'd like to encourage you to check out the We Are Southampton page on Instagram. For match day edits, polls, competitions, and more, be sure to check out We Are Southampton on Instagram. And a special thanks to Matt, who runs the page, for doing the logo for the show, for being a guest, and for also giving me lots and lots of feedback and help whenever I need it. So, um, like I said, my, my conversation this week is, was with you and Campbell. We spoke early Sunday morning, um, and I made a mistake. Uh, we always deal with time changes and differences uh, on the show because I live on the, on the Pacific Coast, and a lot of my guests live elsewhere. Um, and usually what happens is I just say, just tell me what time you want to do it, your time. Tell me where you're at, and then I will do the conversion so that, you know, um, you know I've done this now 31 times, so I, I, I normally don't make mistakes. I mean, I don't make mistakes with the time. I make plenty of mistakes. Um, but what happened this week was um, lots of stuff going on. I'm getting ready to go back to school. I had, I had to go back to work yesterday. Uh, and I'm, summer is over, so my mind is kind of full of all this stuff. Um, and I worked at catering with my wife. It didn't go well. We had all kinds of problems. We got home. And one of my really, really good friends who lives in San Francisco happened to be passing through town. He's like, hey, you know, you want to stop by? Uh, so he stops by. We have a couple of beers. We open a bottle of wine. We barbecue. Um, they leave, there's a glass of wine. I drink that. And I, the whole time I'm thinking that I have to do this interview at 9am Sunday morning. Um, at this point it's like 1130 on Saturday night. And then I realized that I'm not doing it 9am Sunday morning, my time, but it's 9am Sunday morning, UK time, which means I have two and a half hours or so before I have to get up. And, and at this point, there's no, no way that I'm going to be sober in that time. So I, I decided to take a shower, take a nap, wake up, make some espresso, sit down to sound check and nothing works. Uh, so you and, and I are texting back and forth. I'm frantically trying to figure out what's going on. Um, I finally get some, some audio on, on both channels instead of just one. And we decide to go because we're on a bit of a time issue. Um, one, the espresso is only going to last so long. And two, you uh, and has, has things to do, which is why we're doing it at that time. And so, as we're doing this, um, you know, if you hear me make some some weird comments or you hear me struggle for some words, that that's why. And I apologize. That's totally my fault and it's unprofessional. Um, but it's free podcast. Get what you pay for. So um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed. Hope it doesn't detract too much from our conversation. And, uh, you know, I really enjoy the conversation with you and. And I should tell you that the first time I, I met Ewan, and I haven't met him in person, but I saw him on the Ugly Inside year-end season reviews. And since then, we've kind of been chatting back and forth and uh, trying to figure out a good time to get him on the podcast. And and this just turned out to be it. So uh, I owe Ewan a a huge apology and a huge thank you for putting up with uh, with me. Um, and normally, I will I will cut out all, all of my mistakes out of the podcast because I make a lot of them. Um, and this week I did because hell with everything that's going on, we do need a bit of a laugh, I think. So I uh, hope you enjoy the chat and uh, you can find them on Twitter at Ewan Campbell one and I, uh, and here's our conversation. So I'd like to welcome to the Southampton delivery podcast, a podcast dedicated to the Southampton football club and all the SFC fans, Ewan Campbell. You can find him on Twitter at Ewan Campbell one and I, Southampton fan. I remember seeing him for the first time on the Ugly Inside kind of season and review last year. But Ewan, we've been talking kind of back and forth over the over the summer, really, uh, via a Twitter message and stuff. But thanks for joining the show and welcome. No problem. Very happy to be here. It's a great podcast. And sort of really, really glad to sort of get on board and talk, talk about Saints. It's nothing better. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you are getting ready to go to Brighton Atletico Madrid here in a little bit. And what's what's the weather yeah. like right now? Is it nice or is it is it raining or? Yeah, it's nice. It's it's pretty sunny at the moment, and it's a it's a good good forecast for the day. Hopefully, so if it stays nice and sunny, we'll be happy. Nice day by the beach, so all good. 
Yeah, and and Brighton is how far away from you right now? Um, Brighton's about a two-hour drive. Unfortunately, there's no motorway to get to Brighton, so it's actually normally quicker on the train. So I'm getting the train, but it's about just maybe just under a hundred miles. It's not too far. That's not close, though, man. Um, and then, so how far away? How far away are you from from St. Mary's? I'm uh, I live in a little place called Romsey, little town, just on the just outside of Southampton, which is. So we normally normally drive in. It's about a twenty minute drive to do St. St. Mary's, and sometimes I get the train about a ten minute ten minute train to to the middle of Southampton, and then I'll I'll walk to the game from there with the with a lot of other fans. Okay, so public transit is the way to go. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 fairly cheap. So um, normally go there. I go with a couple of friends who also live near me. So it's uh, yeah, it's it, it's pretty easy to get there. I was, I was thinking like um I think it's I think it was Glenn um Glenn De La Cour, yeah. he takes the train I want to say to Brighton for work and I think it's where he does some of his writing and stuff when he writes the blog yeah, yeah sure no it's um, it's not it's, it's 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 not too bad it doesn't feel feel that long so whenever whenever we go it's all always worth it yeah and when you're with your friends so it's not like it's you know it's not like you're sitting there by yourself so yeah, exactly. It's it's it's, it's a relaxed journey. We're there, we're there fairly quickly, and so, but leisurely strolls to, to the ground from, from the train station. So it's all good. Yeah. Well, we got kind of, I mean, a lot to talk about. N- not some new developments, some some not, and then we have uh, uh, two very yeah. different performances and and uh, a game against Swansea to look forward to next weekend. But uh, let's yeah. start just with you know you being a Saints fan, and you, you said you live about you know ten or twenty minutes away. How did you, you know, are your family Saints fans or how did you become uh, a fan of, of the Southampton Football Club? Yeah, so I was, um, my family moved to, my parents moved to uh, Birmingham. They were both in the police, moved to Birmingham for for work. Um, my my mum's side has always been a, all from Southampton. Mum actually lived about five minutes from the from the training ground. So all my all my mum's side Saints fans, all my dad's side are Aston Villa fans. So uh, the rivalry there sometimes, but um, yeah. So I, from the age of three, I think I went to my first game. It was Wolverhampton Wanderers, boring nil-nil draw. Um, and then, sort of first memories were I, I remember going to, going on the I think I was maybe six or seven when we got relegated to the Championship in two thousand and five. Kind of went to a few games sort of intermittently, and then got a season ticket halfway through halfway through the two thousand six seven season, which was. Gareth Bale's kind of first first proper season which he had with us in the championship and we got to the playoffs and then lost in the semi-final to Derby on penalties so since then 10 years 10 or 11 years been a season to get older sort of go with my mum's side of the family uh, my grandparents also went until well my, my nan still goes my grandma passed away a couple of years ago uh, he, he had a season ticket for since since I did as well so they Eight years, and we all go to games together. So drive, drive, drive up, and then sort of walk, walk to the ground from there. So. It sounds like you have some some pretty vivid and, and long-standing memories of just like the tradition of going to the ground and doing that stuff. It, yeah. it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, hundred percent. It's kind of can't remember the time when when sort of thing didn't go to thing goes to the Saints when didn't support them. You know what I mean? So. And and a football season in in the UK and or the Premier League season, I guess it's kind of like baseball season here in the States where it's, it's a long, long season, you know, I mean, it's not like, you know, uh, American football season where it's only a couple of months and, and, you know, you only play, you know, eight, eight home games. You, you're going to 19, 19 home games in the league. And then however many, especially last year of the Europa League, we had another three and then we did well in the cup. So we had, it was quite, it was quite a lot of home games last year, maybe 25, 26 at least. So it was always good. Um, but it kind of just sort of sort of goes on with the with the sort of tradition I've had of going with the family, going to see the Saints. So sort of the same things you do every week, the same people you'd see, like um, sort of program sellers outside the grounds. So just all that tradition of going, which little nice things which you which you remember. Yeah, yeah. And then where? So where do you you guys all sit together? Or you sit with your friends now that you're older, or what? How? To, yeah. So my grandparents used to sit in the same with my grandma was, was was in a wheelchair. Um, since he passed away, my my nan has come to come to sit with us. So I went with my mum, my sister, 
and my nan and my uncle last season. So we all, we all sat together. And then this year, I'm sat with them and I've got two friends alongside me. Uh, and then sh- for away games, they wouldn't really, wouldn't really go with this, like spend time, time with the family. It's quite, it's quite a time consuming hobby. So spending time with the family with, with sort of away games, and I, I go with friends to, to away games whenever I go normal. All right. And then what about your dad in Aston Villa? Is he, is he still, you know, does he go to any matches or do you just kind of have to like, you know? Unfortunately, no. he's in a very sort of full-time job. Don't get to go that often, but um, we've got, still got family in Birmingham who, who, who go to games. And of course, recently, especially when getting relegated, they're on, they're on TV a lot over here. So still like, still like to watch them when they get to change. But. All right. And then what, what stand do you guys sit in? We sit in the, in the family stand in the Kingsland, Kingsland sort of chapel in the corner. But mainly, mainly because it's, A, it's a hell of a lot cheaper than sitting anywhere else. I think last year my season ticket worked out to about eight pound a game, which is ridiculous value in the Premier League. And so all, all sit together and also it makes, it makes it a little bit cheaper for everyone else. So if we can, if we can sort of, Make make sort make a day of it sort of thing. It becomes a little bit cheap. Yeah, and so was that the view? Because you took a video of uh, I think it was Jack Stevens' goal uh, this today. Yeah, and or yeah. yeah, was that that was it? That that's your seat? That, no, that was actually because it was sort of the Kingsland was actually shut yesterday. Some some League Cup games uh, they'll shut one of the normally the Kingsland uh, and or the Chapel they'll shut those stands and sort of fill up the itching at Northern first because uh, sort of saves money on stewarding and stuff like that. And if they don't have to open it, they, they won't. And sort of, I think the attendance was about 15,000 yesterday, uh, maybe maybe a bit more. And of course, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't a, uh, an away sort of end for the severe fans because there wasn't a lot of them. So it was all everyone, everyone in one. And so I was actually sat where the away fans would normally sit. Never, never. They've been there before, but that's where the away fans would sit. So it's the opposite, opposite sort of diagonal corner to where I would normally sit. Because I've been brought up sort of 10 years sitting in the same same area, most of the time we kick towards the northern end first, and then second half we'll kick down towards the chapel. Our team attacking our end in the second half. So when they change, and I think the northern sort of, they've got this sort of thing in their heads that they don't like, don't like them changing it. So that they swap around in, in sort of the first half. It, it's just I, I think it's just sort of men, mentally where it should be, and that's why it felt a bit weird to sit in the other end and and not seeing us attacking really that that closely in the second half. But that that's my that's that's why I don't really want to move because I quite like quite like sitting there and, and seeing seeing hopefully some goals coming up coming up our end in the second half when it's getting a bit more exciting towards the end of the game. Yeah, yeah. So, so last year you wound up on the ugly inside the end of their end of season review, uh, kind of on the panel. Uh, how, how did that come about? How did you wind up on, on there? Well, I've been, the ugly inside is a sort of long, long term sort of fanzine. It started out, I think as a, I, I don't remember, I wasn't alive, but my, my family has told me it started out at Nick Illingsworth started with a couple of others, maybe in the, in the eighties, as it, it was like a, a fanzine sort of like little, little match day magazine, um, and then sort of as technology's gone on, it's turned into a website and a forum, and a, and, a, and then more recently a, a YouTube channel. And I've been been watching sort of what Freddie's been doing with that, and I'm sort of really impressed. So a lot of other teams have been doing it as well with, with their fan, and he's been working with a lot of other teams. I just think I just think it's quite. A, Quite an interesting thing to see because it kind of it's quite succinct in the sort of in the interviews. There's a wide range of views from lots lots of different types of fans. I just, I just thought it was a really really good idea, and I think he's done a great job of it. Um, the offer came up. I think he put it on Twitter from the Ugly Inside handle that uh, they were doing sort of end of season reviews, which I'd watched last year. Really, really sort of liked the sort of format that they had going, and just. He said that if anyone wants to come down to uh, the Five Rivers pub near sort of Portswood Way, Southampton, which isn't that far from me. I think it's about 10, 15 minutes on the train. So I thought I, I'd love to be involved. I gave, him a, gave him a message. He said, yeah, come on down. So re- really enjoyed it and sort of met, met some like-minded fans, really. Yeah. 
do you have any desire to do that type of, of work outside of outside of that? Or was it kind of a one time deal and maybe you'll go back again this year? Or? 100%. I'm, I've been speaking, speaking on and off with um, the guy I've been signing up about doing this sort, this sort of fan cams after after the games. Something something I'm really interested in, and hopefully hopefully going to do that more, more and more often this this season because sometimes getting home after the game, family want to get away quickly, but with going with friends, it's a bit more laid back now. So yeah. hopefully I'll be able to be able to, to be able to do do some more work with them. And yeah, it's a great channel, and they've got some really good people on it as well. Yeah, I, I've been super impressed with everything that they've done, and and uh, Freddie and Clive were on this show way early on. But they've been they've been fantastic to work with, and I was really excited yeah. when they asked me to do something, and I was also super nervous. And it was uh it, it was good to just be a part of it, and then and uh yeah I, I I like it, and you know I think right after that is when we started to to kind of talk, and that's where this came from. So that's that's nice. Yeah. So, kind of moving on to the team, well, I guess the biggest story that we have right now is the Virgil Van Dyke kind of situation, and yeah. my. Im- kind of my impression was as to what I thought was going to happen would be, you know, the team left to, to go to France and they, and they left him to train on his own. I kind of thought that with the club kind of making their stance clear that he would, I don't know, I guess I just assumed he would turn around and go, okay, well, I'm going to play for you then. Cause that's been what's kind of happened with, with Mount Nyama and with Mane and with Schneiderlin uh, yeah. and a few others. And now it's not really happened. So I guess looking at it, we don't really know what he's thinking or anything like that, but what do you think the board or how do you think the board has hand, handled this? Do you think they've dealt with this the right way so far? I think, I think it's always difficult for the board and I don't think any criticism re- should really be leveled at the board because from Les Reed's point of view, he's seen that Virgil van Dijk had an incredible first season with us and he's thought, if he keeps on playing like this, we're going to have offers coming in. So he's thought to himself, right, we're going to tie him down to a long-term deal and that that's all he can do, really. So he's tied him down to a six-year contract, which is virtually unheard of, really. It's unheard of of players seeing their contracts out that long. But it's a, it's a, it's unusual for any contract to go past five years, really. And for such a big player coming into the prime of his career, I think it was a massive coup to get him on on a six-year contract. But the board has then come to the, the end of this season, knowing full well that they're probably going to receive offers for Van Dijk and. If he comes up to the board and says that he want, wants to leave, I don't really see how the board, what the board can do about it. It's a lose-lose situation because if they, if they say to him, right, you're not going anywhere, he could very easily say, right, I'm not playing there. And turn into a bit of a Sado Berrinho at West Brom situation where he was sat on the bench unfit for 18 months and then goes for half the price of what he would have done uh, when he went to Stoke and his career hasn't been the same since. And we get less money for him. or we sell him, cash in, and we've lost our best player. I don't think any criticism leveled at the board is really fair because I think they've done all they can, especially in modern-day football. If the transfer window closes and uh, he's still at Saints, you can go one of two ways. He can either not play and we're a centre-back down and our captain down, and he can go on a, go, go a lot cheaper probably next next season because we're not, we're not going to deal with it for two years. Um, or he can pull his socks up, play, and then hopefully play well, and then go like Schneider and Wanyama did next year for hopefully an even bigger fee. My opinion is he can't really afford to sit on the bench. Like he, If, if he is at Saints when the transfer window closes, he has to play. With the World Cup coming up and everything else, he's got to put himself out there. Otherwise, he won't be on the squad. I, I can't imagine that that Dick Advocat, who did speak out this week and say we should let him go, yeah, I, um, I can't imagine he's going to put him on the World Cup squad or, or you know, when you got other people that are vying for those positions if, if he's sitting on the bench not playing because that I, I don't know but I, I'm not an international manager obviously so I, who knows um, and I think that the board has done a, a good job of, of dealing with the situation being very clear and upfront with him but I kind of wonder if you know he looked at Southampton as a stepping stone because that is what a lot of players have kind of used us as in the past and I think we've been pretty clear with that that's kind of you know we'll bring you in we'll develop you and and then you move on but do you think maybe he's feeling like why why am i the one you know why is it now that you stop that 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 process of of coming in for a year or two and moving on do you think he kind of feels maybe slighted a little bit i mean i know we're speculating but i I think i think virgil's probably looked at the situation seen what's happened with previous players and thought 
if I play well for them, because Saints generally get the best out of their players. Saints players tend to play their best football whilst playing for us and then move on to bigger clubs. Ralph Krug came out start of the summer and said, listen, we're in a financial position now where we don't have to sell players. Previously, when we were sort of establishing ourselves in the Premier League, we had to sort of gain more squad depth by selling players and then reinvesting in the squad. Hence why now, although our, our first teamers are maybe not as, haven't got as much quality as they, as they have done something, the squad depth is a hell of a lot better than it was a year or two ago. So Virgil's probably feeling a bit, a bit hard done by that he's in a situation where, where, he, where he's not allowed to leave. But at the end of the day, he signed the contract, took the extra money, and he's, he's tied down to the club for another five years. Yeah, and like you said earlier, the, the six-year contract, that is a, that is a very – it's a long, long time. You look at the, the lifespan of, of most footballers, and I, center backs tend to stick around maybe a little bit longer than, than like yeah. wingers or midfielders. But still, six years takes him through the primary of his career and kind of into the, the latter stages. And he, he did sign that contract, but um, it's almost like you feel he didn't ever really intend on, on seeing it all the way out. And I don't think a lot of players do. I think they, they realize that, that, that the clubs are going to do that to kind of time up a little bit and be able to sell them on for a bigger fee. Um, but we'll have, to, we'll have to see. Do you want him at Southampton when the transfer window closes? Do you want him to be a Saints player still, or do you, do you want him to move on? I think at, at this stage... He hasn't gone as too far as where he can't come back into the team. I think, well, all football fans in general are quite thick of where so they want players to play for the club, but they also want them to come out and say, oh, I'm staying. Um, so I, I'd like him to stay purely because of the fact that he's, a, he's our best player. Like, for me, a country mile. So he's our only sort of player that's getting into that sort of top, top bracket. So... I say yes. I wanted to stay, but only if he is committed to the cause for this year. I'm I'm not really that bothered because players come and go so often, especially with Saints. I'm not really that bothered about his thoughts beyond next season, whether he wants to stay beyond that. We've said we we've said we're not going to let him go. I think the best thing in his case is to get his head down, play well, and then hopefully he'll another club will stump up enough money next summer and he'll get his move that he wants. But until then, he just needs just needs to play well. Just give his all to the club, the club that's actually paying his wages. He's on six seventy thousand pounds a week, so I think he owes he owes the club who made an investment when others didn't and play for us for the next year, and then and then we'll go from there. But I hope he, I I hope he stays. If he does, if if he chooses to be childish and sits sits on the bench, says I'm not playing. Well, it's his loss, and less clubs will be in for him next summer. I think somebody either mentioned it. I'm not sure if it was uh, on the podcast or just in casual conversation elsewhere that he kind of pulled a similar stunt at Celtic and other players will be, or other teams will be looking at this and going like, well, you know, unless you're Barcelona or Real Madrid or Bayern Munich, then you are a stepping stone to the, to those clubs. And so maybe teams will be less likely to sign him, you know, unless he's, unless it is one of those really elite clubs and they, they might look at it and go like, we don't want that attitude in our team anyway. So he could be he could be hurting himself in the long run, but uh, we will see. Um, I I do I do kind of hope he stays as well. I like you said he is by far the best player. I'm not sure he's got what it's what it takes to be a captain at this point, um, given his his kind of behavior. But he's kind of one of those guys where you can, you you would welcome him back just because he is he is so good. And I hate to say that because I feel yeah. like that's that's given in to him. But uh, yeah, you know, that is that is kind of kind of it. Um, but most recently, we've had the the bid or the the supposed bid from Chelsea getting ready. But it looks like they're they're doing other things as well. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's going to happen or not. And uh, inevitably, as soon as we're done recording, something will happen that's concrete, and then we'll be we'll be totally wrong. So yeah, uh, whatever. Um, but kind of looking at at the club that, or the, the the squad that we do have that that are playing that are committed to the cause, so to speak. We have uh we had two friendlies this week. Uh, one against German opposition, one against uh, Spanish opposition. And midweek against Augsburg, we didn't play well, but I think clearly from the team sheet that was not that was not a first team squad. Uh, that was not the strongest eleven that we could have put out there. And I think that was on purpose because that those that those eleven were gonna play today. But um yeah. the stream wasn't working all that well here 
I've seen the highlights. So what, what did you kind of make? What did you gather from, from that match? Um, I think a lot of preseason is about, is about getting players fit and about get, getting the minutes because we want to want to get into the, at the start of the season, not just our first 11 being, being ready to play, being, being match fit. So, and I, I'm not really too bothered generally about the results preseason. It's more about the performance getting the manager's style of play implemented and the players sort of understanding that. And I think with the, the Augsburg game, we, we did play sort of a, I wouldn't say second string, but a, a weekend side. There was a, there was, there was a lot of changes. Um, and I, I'm, I'm more sort of, more, more convinced now after, after going to the severe game yesterday that that was our first team. Or, or near enough, uh, our, our best, our best team according to the manager that played, and that's why I'm sort. Of, I'm trying to put, trying to put the Alsberg against the back of my back of my head, so we don't really have to talk about it uh, after we after we've just been so they're quite comfortable. Right, right. I agree with you. And for me, you know, I I am a, a major league baseball fan through and through. And mm-hmm. in baseball, we're, you're not going to get upset about one game because game you play well first of all you play 162 of them which is a ton and if you if you if you if your kind of hopes and dreams rest on every single game then you're going to be exhausted but um it seems like like football opinions change so from one game to the next so much more than i'm used to and it's something i'm still kind of yeah. adjusting to as a fan um it seemed like people were pretty upset and there were there were some kind of um you know, some people are out there saying like, it, it's just one preseason match. Don't worry about it. It's obviously not the first level. And other people are going, you know, we're getting relegated. We're going to finish 15th or, you know, it's going <laughs> to be that. But today or yesterday, and I'm sorry, I keep referring to it. It's still early in the morning. Um, uh, when, when you were at the Sevilla match, did, was the, the atmosphere decent or were people kind of worried about the, the team? Did they seem to get down on the team right away or, or what, what was that like? No, not at all. Um, I was not. Not surprised, but I was slight, slightly, slightly a little bit, bit more, bit more sort of happy about how the how, how the atmosphere was. It was after we'd just been thrashed four 0 on the Wednesday, and of course, uh, I don't know if you know this, but the Virgin Media did a did a deal that you could get both games, get both get both games for the price of one. So a lot of the fans that went to one on Wednesday would have been at the one on on the sun, on the Saturday, um, and that could I think that could have affected the the atmosphere, but because because it was you know it was, it was a nice sunny day, um, get getting to see the team, um, I think the atmosphere was was good. There was no sort of neg- I didn't sense any sense any negativity at all in the ground at all. When when a player made a mistake or anything, no, nothing more than the usual oh god what's what's happened there sort of thing. Um, but I, I think with the Augsburg game, people got a bit sort of disheartened, a because it was the first game at home in pre season. And so the fans, especially when it's been such a long break without football, they want to they want to come back and want to see a good performance. Um, and it was raining as well. I think I think that disheartens some people a bit. But after a nice sunny day and a, a good performance yesterday, I think any any sort of memories of, of Wednesday were kind of forgotten. So it's all right. And, and I guess looking back now that preseason is over, obviously this is Pellegrino's first preseason with the team. Do you think it was a success? And I know a lot of that will probably ride on you know, how we do in the league, but just looking at the preseason, do you think he's done well with, with the team? Yeah, I think ideally I would have had, I'd have had more games. To be honest with you. I think a lot of teams are now doing sort of this sort of split, split, splitting the squad so that they can get more minutes by playing two different games. And I think ideally they would sort of play more games because it always gets to the sort of the first, first game of the season and I always say, oh, we didn't have enough time. This sort of thing. So I think overall, overall it was a success based on yesterday's performance because that's a combination of all the games put together. But I, th- I think we played really well against St Etienne. I don't know if you watched that. Um, and at the Augsburg game is the only only sort of disappointing one. So if we can sort of focus on the most recent one, Sevilla, which was our first team, and we had a lot of options to come off the bench as well, which didn't play the likes of Hoiberg, Austin. So we're sort of pleased with how, how it sort of came to a close. Uh, and the only thing with regards to the club is that next season they didn't, they didn't, they probably don't really care about it as much, but they didn't tell the fans very early about the, about the friendlies. 
and I went to I went to Holland last year. We drove <laughs> from from Southampton to watch to watch the game against FC Twente um, in Old Oldenzaal, which was about a about 12, 13 hour drive. And they told us nice and early in advance that people can plan their trips. Um, I know, especially with, like Nick Gregory from Saints Away Travel, he took some fans to um, to Austria. So I just think it's fair to, if they do know these, tell the fans as early as possible, because otherwise it kind of makes it difficult for them to, to support the team away from home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did see a lot of, uh, or a few complaints, I should say, online about the notification of, of when and where they were playing. And, and that, that is true, but you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that they, they knew exactly what they were doing, uh, you know, with the, the managerial stuff and things like that. And I think maybe that played a part in it. Um, although you hope not, although you hope that the club goes up, no, this is where we're going and this is what we're doing. But, um, sure. but you know, this might be the last year you guys really have an easier time getting into Europe, you know, <laughs> it can be difficult yeah. coming up. Um, exactly. <laughs> maybe, well, maybe we'll be able to drive next time. Maybe after, maybe after fly and get visa and whatnot, but make the, make the most of it while we have it, to be honest. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, I guess kind of looking at you know what you've seen from the team do you think that we have done enough in in the window or do you think that we are 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 lacking anywhere and uh we've been linked with mario lamina late saturday i guess um but how are you feeling going into into the season with the squad that we have and and where do you where do you think we need to to really improve i think our squad depth has been has, has been very good this year because I think with last season we had big players, sort of some key injuries, Virgil van Dijk, and people were were worried, sort of um, understandably, when Jack Stevens came in. Um, he's been nothing short of a revelation, having only really played first team football regularly in League One, and he's not he's not he's not that young. He's sort of 23 now, I think he is. So centre back is all, all all dependent on Virgil van Dijk. If Virgil van Dijk comes back and plays, we don't need another centre back. If he says, right, I'm not playing at all, 100% we need another centre-back because I think we we struggled against better teams than ourselves to compete in the A in the air because Jack Stevens is six foot one, as is uh, Mario Chida. Jack Stevens hasn't really been uh, centre-back first team-wise. He's been, so before before last season, he's been playing as a right-back with, with Swindon, uh, no, sorry, defensive midfielder. With, with Swindon, uh, hence why he's sort of quite good at quite good at passing and bringing the ball out um, from the fence, as you can see. But I think he needs more experience with a. This is no criticism of Mario Chida, but a more physical sort of player alongside him because he hasn't. He's not big, brutish, and strong like Virgil is. So I would like to see another centre back come in if Virgil does decide he, he's not going to play. Yeah, see, for me, I, I'd like a centre back no matter what. Just because yeah. I know that in the back of my mind, I know that Virgil is is at least got eyes on the exit door, you know, whether it's this season or next season. And I think what, maybe I've just had it said to me so many times that I'm starting to believe it that you, you don't want to change both center backs at once. Um, so I would like a, a new kind of center back there, but I don't know. Like I think I think Stevens has been great, and uh, we were kind of talking with some people earlier, and we were kind of talking, you know, if Virgil comes back, who who plays with him, whether whether it's Stevens or Yoshida, and I think for me, it's got to be Stevens. I think Stevens is the future at that position at the team, and I think Yoshida is is going to be always like a, a the third the third center back. You know, I don't think he's ever going to be that that kind of uh, Premier League level starter, especially for where we want to go. I think if we're looking to the future. Uh, we're looking to sort of get back into the Europa League. Love Mario Shida's bits, but he's not hes not the sort of first-team regular starter that, that you would ideally want. I think at centre-back, we've got four players at the moment. We've got Yoshida, we've got Stevens, we've got Van Dijk. Uh, well, leave Van Dijk out. We've got Bednarek and we've got Garlos. I think Garlos will leave this with this summer and a prop. I'm surprised he's still with us, to be honest. Um, he's a nice guy and I love his bits, but he... Yeah, he's had a lot of tough injuries, and I, I don't think he's he's, he's really going to ever get a chance, as it's as it's been sort of shown this preseason. So I think Garvis will leave. I was surprised at the, the sort of Benderek transfer because he's not as as a lot of these sort of. Like, I saw you talking to one of the one of the fans. They kind of said they don't think he's ready for the Premier League, and normally fans have a have a good idea about that. So 
I, I was sort of surprised that he maybe he, he was going to go out on loan because I don't think he's really a, a first teamer. But yeah, I would like would like to see would like to see another centre back. Um, also, I think I'm quite glad that Sam Gallagher's come back. He played he played a lot of games when he was when he was when he was younger when, when sort of with Ricky Lambert. Um, and he did well, and I was surprised he got he got a big injury. I sort of felt for him a bit when he when he went out on loan to MK Dons in at the best of times. And after playing well in the championship last year, I was surprised that he himself has just signed a new new deal. I was surprised that he didn't want to sort of test himself permanently by going somewhere, maybe maybe in the championship or lower Premier League, so that he could kind of kind of push himself to play play first in regular football because he's at that age now, twenty one where he sort of needs to be playing regular football to, to improve. Looking ahead to next week, uh, with the squad that we have, would you make any changes from the lineup that played against Sevilla going into next yeah. week, or, or do you think that that's the lineup we go with? Uh, sorry, I went, I went a bit off topic there with the, so, you know, the whole transfer. No, no, you're good, um, you're good. If, if Lamina comes in, which he's expected to either today or tomorrow, um, I don't think he should go in straight away. I think he needs time to sort of bed in with the manager and understand what he wants from him. Um, personally, I would play, I, I would swap Tadic out because I'm kind of surprised he's still with us, to be honest, because I quite like some sort of fresh legs. I saw yesterday against Sevilla, we're playing a lot of, a lot of the time on the counter attack and Tadic doesn't have the sort of, sort of pace that ideally you would want. So I'd maybe, maybe swap him out. Um, Will Prowse is playing a bit further up. So may, maybe bring in, uh, personally, I, I'd play Charlie Austin. I'd play Charlie Austin up front. I'd play Gabbiadini uh, in behind. And I'd play Ward Prowse uh, and Redmond on, the, on either side. So that that's the only real change I'd make with the out of the equation. Um, but I think I think that was pretty much our first team that we saw yesterday. Um, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that team did start next week. Although I would, I'd bring in Charlie Austin because I think he's underrated by a lot of same players. Yeah, and would you bring in Charlie Austin because of the matchup with Swansea, or do you think that that makes us just a better team overall? Well, especially last season, Swansea were, were, were shocking defensively, and I do think I think Charlie Austin gives us something that we don't have in terms of if there's a one-on-one situation. Charlie Austin's the person in the team to score. I think Gabbiadini is a, is, a, is a great footballer. I don't think he's our best striker. I think he, he has a lot of aspects to his game which other, other strikers don't. That's why he's quite versatile. He can play anywhere across the, the sort of front, front three. But with Austin, I think he's got aerial ability. He's quite good in the air. And I think we're going to get quite a few chances next week against Ponzi. So I think if you need to take the chances, that's that's the reason I play Charlie Austin. I think against sort of maybe maybe better teams where where, where Gabby Dini is needing, where we're sort of we're, we're pressurising and we're not going to get a lot of chances in like tighter games against maybe like Ever- Everton, sort of West Ham, where the game's going to be quite tight. I think sort of that little bit of movement when when we're on the ball from Gabby Dini is, is perfect for next week, especially as, as a central striker. I, I just think I just think Austin's the best choice. Actually. Not many people agree with me on that, but no, that that I think that's fine. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a I think it's a reasonable opinion, and and you have some some idea of as to why you think that. So I think that's all I I care about. Um, yeah. <laughs> you're entitled to, to kind of think whatever you want. Um, yeah. and I think that you know, my brother it likes QPR uh, quite a bit, and so I remember watching Charlie Austin and, and always hating playing against him. Uh. You know, he seemed to always be the guy that didn't really matter if he didn't do anything for 87 minutes, he was going to score. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I think I think that does bring an element of uh, of being the true kind of old school kind of striker that 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 we don't have uh, elsewhere on the team. So, um, I think. Go ahead. So I, I think I think with Austin, people don't like him a lot. Of, a lot of the reasons why they why they maybe why people dislike about Simon Pedro is that his his build up play is minimal. Charlie Austin is a, is a goal scorer, he's a poacher. He, he might do nothing for 90 minutes, but he'll get you that goal in tight games that wins you the game. And that, that's what I kind of like about him. I like that he's a, a goal scorer, which is the hardest thing to do in football. Um, 
My that's the only reason I kind of think he goes underappreciated because I think he, I think if you give Charlie Austin a 38 game season and he's playing every game, I know he's had injury problems. I think he scores 15 to 20 goals, and I'm not sure if Gabby Vini does that. That's the only time. All right, all right. Um, along with along with that in the in the Swansea the Swansea match, do you? There's a giant spider on the wall, which is kind of freaking me out a little bit. I keep watching it. Um, <laughs> so I, I guess looking at, at the team we have and, and going into the season, where where do you think we we have the potential to finish this season uh, in terms of standings? Are we saying Lamina's coming in? Um, yeah, sure. Um, difficult because the transfer is doesn't. Not over, and also we don't know if Van Dyke. Uh, so nice. If Van Dyke comes back and plays like he did last season, I've got. I I think we can challenge for sixth or seventh. Honestly, though, I think our squad is is very strong, and given that we underperformed last year, still got eighth. I think the, the sort of the, the points we need to fight for, the ones we didn't get last season, um, which we did the previous season with Kuhn, was we basically beat every team below us. Uh, home and away, we we were sort of we beating all the teams below us home and away, which we didn't do last season, and we were also picking up points off off of some of the big boys, which we also didn't do last season. So I think if we were to if we were to to to, to play that sort of uh, game and style of play that we did under Kuman, this squad for me has has everything it needs to challenge for sixth or seventh in the Europa League places. I think people have seen the sort of money that Everton are splashing out. And kind of feel like we're we're not doing that as much. I think that what what they've what they've actually done and what they've signed isn't isn't overall that 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 great. I think their their goalkeeper is is a, is a good goalkeeper, he's a good, good prospect, but I don't think he's had, I don't think he's any any better than Fraser Forster at the moment. Um, and I think their defence is is not as good as ours as well. It's very well by place. So I do think we're sort of on a par with them, and it will all, all depend on. On how sort of the manager implements the style of play, and how we play against the teams around us, and what we do in relation to their result. I'm under the impression that we, I mean, we definitely underperformed last year, and I think that we can do a lot better. Not that I wouldn't take some of the some additions to the squad, especially to kind of push guys along. And but you look at the season that Tadic had, the season that Buffal had, the, the season that some of the other players on our, on, our, on our squad had and you just go like that's not the norm that they've had over the over previous seasons whether it's with our club or other clubs and so if they can just get back to the levels that they were at maybe the season before that i think we're we're a much different team we finish um i don't know if we catch everton but i think we make it a little more interesting uh for everybody yeah. so I, I i i'm there with you um and and in the our club just doesn't go out and spend you know we're not going to go sign arnaltovich for that type of money that's just not the kind of club that we are and I kind of, I like that. That's part, I mean, I, I didn't grow up in Southampton. I didn't grow up, uh, you know, I had a choice of all the, of all the teams in England. I chose Southampton and, and it wasn't because we got and splashed a bunch of money. So uh, I, I can't be upset when they, when they don't do it. So. No, sure. I, I also, I, I love that. I love that thing about the club. A lot, lot of, I'm not going to complain if, if the club guy and splash the cash, but I think it's, it, it shows how good we are at recruiting that we are on par with, other teams around us whilst not splashing the cash. I think West Ham's recruitment is abysmal to be honest with you. I think generally they they overspend or they don't get the right players and a lot of their transfers more 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 often than not their transfers fail. So our recruitment is top notch. And I don't think we need to go out and spend mass amounts of money to compete, although some of the fans might say might say might say that we do. I think the players that we brought in or that we've brought in previously are as good quality as the ones that other teams do, and we spend less. So, I'm not sure what, why why people complain really. Maybe last season, maybe our recruitment wasn't the best, but I think if we do well this season, I'm not sure that, that people can complain too much, especially when we don't have the money to invest. In them. I think that's why sort of with with the with the chairman and uh, the owner looking to maybe get some investment in the club. Maybe if we do get the investment, then maybe we'll start splashing out a bit more on players. But until then, the, the owners have done a lot for us. I'm not sure we can really complain on that. But. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I mean, we, we've covered kind of a lot. I think I've been kind of bouncing around. I've had, you know, I, we had audio issues at the beginning that I was dealing with. And then 
the stupid spider on the wall has got my attention because I'm scared to death. But um, we have a few listener questions, and I know you have to go catch the catch the train because you've got to go uh, down to Brighton. So let's let's kind of run through this if that's okay. Um, Jim, who is at Simply Romeu, uh, asked us, would you guys be happy with Yoshida and Steven starting as our center backs in the Premier League, or do you think we need a defensive signing? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> to, to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy with that purely because I think if we want to push ourselves to the next level, we need to think bigger. And because football is a, is a, is a game of sometimes the harsh brutality of it, those two center backs physically aren't going to be able to deal with Big strong centre forwards, likes Lukaku. Likes Lukaku. I went to the 3 0 uh, away loss to Everton. Virgil van Dijk played that day and struggled with Lukaku. I know Lukaku is one of the best strikers in the world, maybe in maybe in the Premier League, maybe not the world. But um, <laughs> I think that we, I think I definitely think we need centre back re- reinforcements. And I think Jack Stevens isn't isn't 100 percent ready to play week in week out in a 38 game season. And the same with Yoshida. So I, w- I would like to see another centre back coming. Good, good question. And and then Dan, who's at Holy Hoiberg, asked us, uh, "What do you think of the Saints reportedly closing in on on Lamina?" And you know, I I'm never one to like. I don't want to talk really talk a, a lot about a player until it's it's done because you know who knows. Um, yeah. But if he comes in, do you think that pushes Classy out the door? And if so, what do you what did you what do you make of Classy uh, as a Saints player? Um. I think the Lamina transfer, if it goes through, is, is evident of how far Saints have come, especially with the Hoiberg transfer as well. It shows the calibre of players which we can now attract to the club and the fees we're willing to spend to get these players. I think Classy is a good player. No doubt that. He's an, he's an international for Holland and he was fantastic. One of the best players in the Dutch league when he, when he played there. I, I'm slightly disappointed it hasn't worked out for him. I think the physicality of the league, although I don't want to say that's the reason that he's failed, or the reason he hasn't done as well as he, he would have liked or had as much game time because Kante is showing that you don't have to be big to be a central defensive midfielder. I just feel if we want to go to that next level, this is the sort of squad depth we need to have. And Lamine is a, is a fantastic prospect. He's only 23. Um, and with regards to Classy, I think he'll be disappointed with his time here. I, I, I don't think he's a bad player by any stretch of the imagination. And I think he could still do it in the Premier League for. Um, Another club. I, I'm just slightly sad that it hasn't worked out for him, worked out from here. But he isn't that sort of Romeo figure where he will uh, bully opposing midfielders. Do you know what I mean? So, and I think Lamina is the. We don't have a lot of sort of legs in midfield. Romeo is. He's always in the right position, but he's not the quickest. So I think Lamina is sort of that workhorse across the ground, a bit like Kante. So that's why I think we've brought him in where he can maybe do the running for Romeo um, and sort of give ourselves a bit more legs and a bit more sort of energy in midfield, a bit more fights. Do you know what I mean? So that, that, that's why I think um, we're, we're sort of we're, we're close signing up. I do think we do sign will be a fantastic player for us. All right. And I just have one more question for you before uh, I let you go. And I appreciate your time and I want to say, say thank you. Um, and just so we're clear, this, this question, there is no winning. There is no good answer here. Um, if I'm going to give you, it sounds like you like to go to uh, other grounds and things like that. If I'm going to give you uh, a, a season pass or season ticket to another Premier League ground, which one do you pick? We'll ignore, we'll ignore travel because uh, I'm not going to go see. I'm going to go see Newcastle play. Uh, <laughs> but I, I would pick Tottenham. Now, I'm not too keen on Tottenham's fans particularly, but as a team, they are everything that I would like Saints to be in the future. Probably because they've got our ex-manager, but, um, <laughs> but they've sort of they've got that big talismanic centre forward English striker that scores loads of goals. They've got an attacking creative midfielder who's English who scores goals and is a bit arrogant. Deli Ali. They've got a creative midfielder who can whip in free kicks. So I appreciate it. They've got two big strong central defensive midfielders who just blast everyone out of the way. Mm-hmm. And they they've got a uh, two centre backs who are who are silky and classy on the ball. So they they have literally they they have got everything. Um, they, they play fast attacking football, um, and on those that they got they get some stick for some maybe bottling it or maybe not always going the full way. I think they're fantastic to watch, and they didn't lose a game at home last season. So who? I, that, oh yeah, I get season tickets off. 
All right. I, I think and they're playing at Wembley, so I want to go to Wembley. Yeah. Hey. Uh, yeah, I think that's a, I think it's a good shout. And uh, I, like, like I said, I want to thank you for your time and I appreciate it. And I, I wish we had more time to kind of sit here and, and, and do this, And but we'll just have to do it again. I think that's all that means. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me, Matt. And I really hope you all, all the best for the, all the best for the show. I don't think you get all, all the, all the sort of, sort of credit you deserve. And I think more fans, more fans should listen to it. So keep on going with it. Oh, I appreciate that very much, man. Um, I think the, the best part of the show for me is, is talking to people like you and, and getting to hear kind of different opinions and things like that. And, uh, you know, if a few people listen, great. Um, <laughs> as long as nobody's, uh, you know, slighting me on Saints web, I, I think I'm, I think I'm doing all right. So, <laughs> <laughs> appreciate that all right man well uh i'll let you go and let, i don't want to make you late for the train and uh, enjoy your time and i'm gonna i'm gonna go back to bed <laughs> don't blame you matt thank you so much me. all right cheers Once again, that was my conversation with Ewan Campbell. Uh, I'd like to thank you for listening and encourage you to follow him on Twitter at Ewan Campbell one and I. And you can also follow this show on Twitter at SFC D-E-L-L underscore I-V-E-R-Y and at Facebook at Facebook.com forward slash SFC delivery. There is no underscore in the Facebook address. Um, if you haven't done so yet, be sure to subscribe to this feed wherever you get your podcast, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, Acast, Google Play, TuneIn Radio, or wherever else. And also, we're now on YouTube and SoundCloud, so however you listen to your podcast, be sure to do that. Um, and if you like this show, if you like podcasts, but you're not sure you like this podcast the best for your saints news because i'm just some random dude from california um there are now other saints podcasts to subscribe to and when we first started this show there were no other saints podcasts out there um now we have several and you know there some some people are telling me you know don't don't promote other shows on your show and it's i'm not going to do that i'm going to you know what i want is for everybody to have the best experience as a fan possible because life is just too short to to argue over over listeners or or views or whatever else you want so um in the show notes to this week's episode there are links to other saints podcasts uh the newest podcast is the total saints podcast with ben stanfield he will hopefully have the weekly guest um adam leach uh you may know him from his work at the daily echo and their first episode is out now and the link to their twitter handle is in the show notes along with the saints fans pod and saints fc podcast and under the halo basically we're all a little bit different uh, we're all obviously going to be talking about the same stuff because there are only so many matches and, and, and trade rumors or transfer rumors or, or sagas going on. But, you know, sometimes people have preferences and I would rather you enjoy what you're listening to than feel like you only have one choice. So uh, check them out. I encourage you to find the one that you like the best and give it a listen. Give it a, give it your support. Uh, you know, maybe you listen to all of them. Maybe you listen to two. Maybe you listen to three. Whatever it is, uh, so be it. So, um that is all there. And of course, we will be back each and every Tuesday with another episode. Uh, we'll be back next week. And uh, we're looking forward to looking back on the Swansea game and looking ahead to the rest of the season. Hopefully, we have some sort of you know wrap up to this Virgil van Dyke situation, which has been causing me more kind of stress than is really necessary because it's it's just soccer. It's just football. So, uh, but whatever. So, uh, all that being said, let's, let's end this and uh, hope you have a, a fantastic day. Thank you for listening. Until next time, remember that together, we march on.